Trevilian Next is a division of Trevilian, a financial services specialist search and talent advisory firm. Since inception, the Trevilian team has dedicated itself to enhancing the return on investment of a company's most important resource, its people. Hello, everyone. Brian Love, head of banking and fintech at Trevilian, and I am joined today by none other than Ron Shevlin, chief research officer at Cornerstone Advisors and also a senior contributor at Forbes and the fintech Snark Tank, one of my favorite people and influencers in the industry. Hi, Ron. Ryan, how you doing? Couldn't find anybody else to be on the show this week, huh? Yeah, way down the list. Your name was there and we kind of settled. Straight to the bottom of the barrel. Well, happy to be here anyway. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, occasionally uh, you, know, you post some things that are intelligent. Most of the other stuff is, you know, pretty forgettable. But um, I'm joking, of course. You actually posted something the other day, which is right in the Trevelyan Ballywick. And the quote, you know, was actually finding and attracting talent. I would argue it is the absolute biggest challenge banks will have for the rest of the decade. And I completely agree. I think a lot of a lot of the audience will agree that that's a huge issue in the space. And I wanted to I wanted to kind of, you know, have a little portal into your brain why you wrote that that day. Yeah, a couple of things that really spurred me for that. Num number one is, you know, for the num past number of years, I've been doing a report called What's Going On in Banking. Ask about the priorities for the coming year. And no surprise that uh, cost reduction, cost containment, efficiency is a big challenge um, for a lot of financial institutions in 2024. But one of the things that caught my eye every year, we ask, so what are your top efficiency cost reduction priorities? And while it was still a minority of overall banks and credit unions, the percentage who said uh, headcount reduction was going to be a top priority uh, doubled. And that's specific, it's specifically surprising among credit unions who have been always loath to, to uh, cut back on people, less so among banks, but still the, the number that doubled. And I looked at that, Brian, I said, I don't know what these people are smoking because you just cannot afford to let people go these days. First of all, you're never going to replace them. Um, if they're experienced people and they're leaving, they're never coming back. I mean, look what happened after the pandemic. We lost so many good people after the pandemic. And the financial crisis, too. And the financial crisis. Um, right. So, yep. I mean, if you're going to let these people go. Now, second is not even the cutback aspect of this. But, you, you know, hey, Brian, I don't know if you've read this anywhere, but um, things are changing in the in the banking industry. I don't know if, if you've like seen that or if anybody's kind of written about that. But there do seem to be a bunch of people who believe the industry is changing. And listen, you didn't get a guy who writes a snark tank uh, <laughs> a blog if you weren't going to you know tolerate some snark and sarcasm on this. So, but I mean, what Bring does it. that really what does that really mean though? What it means is, well, you're going to be offering new products and services to new markets in new different ways. It's and it's all going to be technology based. So, look, it's not just technologists that banks need, and it's not just bankers that banks need. It's some combination of a new set of skills that understands, uh, you know, ecosystems, how to build an ecosystem, um, how to do partnerships, how to integrate all of these things into existing technology platforms and so forth. Uh, what are the, the real unique needs of various customer segments? Mark, you know, look, uh, a bank like Chase, Bank of America might have, you know, 100 people doing those kinds of things. Once you get down to the even hundred billion dollar level in assets, they don't those financial institutions don't have a lot of those people. Yeah. Now, OK, so you're you're a bank CEO and you go, no problem. I'm just going to outsource it. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, guess what? Somebody has to evaluate all the outsourcers, understand the business strategy, understand the technology environment, understand the strengths and weaknesses of the particular vendors who are going to come knocking at your door. And that you still have to integrate it both from a technology and business perspective. Who's going to do this? I don't think most banks have anybody, maybe, you know, a handful of people in, our, in a handful of banks have people with those set of skills. Then, yeah. okay, let's, let's add on to the complexity of this. How many bankers do you talk to, Brian, who want to recruit uh, for a position they have open 
and want that person to move to small town Wisconsin um, because that's where the bank and the footprint is. You know, you, you got the banks who are saying, well, it's our culture. We need to have people in the office. Guess what? Most of the people that actually work for your organization are vendors. You know, you, you outsourced every one of your systems to, to a vendor. So um, everybody who works for you is not within the four walls of your organization to begin with. So if you're going to bring in new hires and attract people, you've got to be more open to a, a more remote work environment. It's just reality. But Brian, I know you've got to be dealing with this too. You, you've just got a bunch of folks in the industry who just want to put the blinders on and say, no, nah, it's still 1997 around here. And we're going to, you know, um, I want bankers who, you know, will it work? I can't tell you. Last point, before, uh, my rant here. Can't tell you how many strategic planning meetings I have sat in with uh, banks where their growth plan is we need a guy. <laughs> we need a guy in that geography. We need a guy. That's the growth strategy. Now, yeah. it's not a sexist thing. It could be a woman. I'm not, you know, or any other thing that you want out there. That's not the point I'm making, but it's we need a person. And that's the growth strategy. And even today, that is that is still prevalent in a lot of financial institutions. Okay, I'm all done, Randy. You can tell me where I'm going wrong here. No, no. A lot of things come to mind. I mean, you're talking about, you know, it's just a, it's an aggregation of vendors. And now I start to think about the, you know, our bank friends that have consent orders because of third party risk management. They tried to do too much and they depended too heavily on vendors that maybe, you know, sold them a bill of goods or maybe they, you know, they just didn't do their own due diligence. So that technique is, is, is tricky and can get you into trouble. And then you talked a little bit about, the geographical component and how, how, yeah, you asked me how many of your, how many people you talk to want a guy or, or, or a girl in that geography. Probably 80% of our searches are, we need people here. Now we did just place a CEO at an Iowa bank and we had a nice conversation with him and his, his chairman. And it was interesting to hear someone who relocated across the country say, I was the outsider, but really the cultural components of the bank he came from and the geography he came from are almost identical to Iowa. I mean, really, why is the geography the driving factor for what makes a cultural fit? I mean, you know, I, and I'm being simplistic and I don't want to offend anyone, but it seems like that's something if you're in this war for talent and you're battling for your life over the next couple decades for sustainability, that's maybe something you should consider ranking a little less on your list. That might be a controversial statement, but I'm with the, sn the snark tank guy, so I'm going to adopt some of the snarkiness. Anyway, but what do you think, Ron? Well, I got to say that I think for a position like CEO, it might be a little bit different. I mean, honestly, yeah. if I'm the chairman of the board of a bank, I actually don't care where that person lives, and I might not care if he or she moves here. But look, reality is, is um, especially if we're talking about a community bank, I want my CEO here a lot to deal with face to face yeah. meetings with, you know, my big clients, my big borrowers, my big depositors. Uh, but I but that's not what I was kind of getting. at. I was talking more about new types of roles, specialty um, skill sets around integration and AI and business strategy and, and partnership. You know, I t still talk to a lot of banks, you know, what are you doing about partnerships? Yeah, well, you know, we got Jenny and Sally out in IT and we've made them the partnership team. I'm like, oh my God, you gotta be kidding me. How many FinTech partnerships can two people identify, vet, negotiate, deploy and scale in a year? And the answer is probably one, maybe two, and is that really having a huge effect on the organization? I don't think so. I think you know, you've got to be looking across every different function for new tools and technologies and partnerships, whether we're talking marketing, product development, fraud, digital platforms, uh, mm -hmm. treasury, everywhere up and down the line. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not enough to just ask the existing treasury management people to go find and develop new products and services. It's not their skill set. It's not their strength. Uh, ultimately, it's not their really job. They're, they're jo you've hired them to execute 
not think and develop and come up with new strategies and things like that. So, um, and then when you start factoring in all the new technology stuff that's coming down the pike, who really understands blockchain and AI and all these kinds of things? And um, I, I just look at this and go, man, I think oh, it's going to be a, you know, the, the winners are going to be those who find the right people because the right people are going to figure out what to do at some point. So if I got the right people, I don't care if I've got the strategy yet, that be their job, figure out the strategy. Yeah, I always ask the question when we're starting to work with a client, where is innovation rooted? A lot of times it's the CEO. I remember when I was in banking, there were like one or two people in the organization that just loved their iPhone, right? And they wanted their branch to look like an Apple store. And, you know, innovation is kind of rooted with those people that think like that. But to your point, innovation needs to really kind of permeate the whole ranks of an organization, right? You, you mentioned something around strategic alignment and nothing being better than that. Um, I wonder if you, if you agree with, with what I just said. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think my take on it is, um, you know, people want to feel like they're all moving and rowing in the same direction. Uh, nothing worse feeling in an organization where, you know, people feel like there's not alignment of priority. You, you cannot have effective prioritization and resource allocation unless there's some clarity of strategy and direction. And I think that causes a lot, a lot of pain for a lot of people in a lot of organizations. Um, but then there's a chicken and egg problem. So how do you determine the, how, you know, if you're in an organization that doesn't have strategic alignment, are the existing players really going to come together and create strategic alignment if they haven't already been able to do that? So mm -hmm. you need probably bring somebody in, whether it's a chief strategy officer, chief innovation officer, chief, I don't care, fill in the blank officer, you know, somebody who's going to be a catalyst for alignment, uh, as well as new capability creation. And we're not talking about easy stuff here. Yeah. You know, the other thing I throw in, too, is and I'm sure you being in this business can remember this. Remember when the big thing was to, like, hire ex Starbucks people because they had such a great. In, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just the Starbucks and the locations around here, but these are not great experiences. Um, oh, jeez. This is, you know, they're like zoos with, you know, 400 coffees sitting there waiting for the mobile water pickups. Can't figure out, <laughs> you know, where your drink is and things. There might only be two people in line ahead of you, but it's still a 20-minute wait because of all the mobile orders. Oh, and then the line around the building of the drive through that's screwing it all up. But it's the wrong model anyway, because, you know, you, if you're hiring people who have great skills at in-person stuff, uh, you're, you're, you're really bucking the trend. But the reality is, is that it, it would never was the right person, even in a branch dominated um, industry, because last I look, uh, Starbucks does not have the regulatory constraints on offering coffee that banks have in offering financial services. Uh, you don't deal with risk and fraud. Um, mm. well, maybe they're dealing with you know fraudulent payments now, but that's more because they've gotten into the the payments business. But you know what I'm saying? It's like it, there's not like there's this pool of people in some other industry that banks are going to be able to poach from because oh they've got the right skill sets. They've gone through all this already. You really want to hire somebody out of the technology Silicon Valley world? This is another one, by the way. Oh shoot. So, you know, um, I had said, you know, people, it's going to really be hard for banks to find people. Somebody said, hey, with all the fintechs laying people off, yeah. why don't the banks just go after that? It's because, because those people didn't want to work at banks. They're yeah. not suited for banks. They like the environment of a, of a fintech or a startup or a technology company. And if they wanted to work in a bank, they'd work in a bank. They would have started off that way. Um, so well, it's not going to be as easy as just hiring the discards from the fintech world. So, Ron, that's such a good point. And it's really it's you've got to thread the needle between someone with an innovation, innovative background who can operate under the regulatory confines of a bank. Right. It And it is a very small percentage of our industry where you can find people who can do that. And I think, you know, at Trevelyan, we've, been, we've, you know, we've really kind of tried to push into that little Venn diagram sliver of people who can think like a fintech, act like a banker, right? 
and they're out there, but it all comes fr- from knowing the industry well, knowing what banks are innovative, what banks are doing interesting things, who you can cherry pick from those places. And also who left banking to go to that fintech that maybe is no longer, you know, growing anymore that may want to come back. Like you said, a lot of them left for a reason, but there are some really good community banks that have been able to, um, to hire great tech talent. The cultural element is all is always what makes me nervous when you go even upstream to, like you said, a chase or a city that's got a hundred people doing, you know, th- this integration. Pulling someone like that and putting them in a bank isn't always the, at a community bank, isn't, isn't necessarily a great idea either. You're going to have to almost, it's almost like, um, unlearning period of like having them understand how a community bank functions. Um, so I don't know if, if you agree with that thought. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, here's what I'd say though. Um, I don't think is this, the, the challenge is as much finding somebody with banking experience who can do this. I think it's about finding, just generically somebody with the right set of skills, aptitude, desire. Yeah. I don't care where they come from. You know, I think I can say this now um, safely, um, you know, 25 years in of focusing on nothing but financial services and banking, but I have, I have never worked a day in my life in a bank. And what do I do? I tell bankers what to do. Um, and <laughs> I, I have, I took 10 years of that, Ron. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I didn't. I, I skipped to the good part, telling them what to do. I didn't go to the hard part. <laughs> Smart and thinking. It's funny. I had a I had a colleague years ago at Forrester Research when I was there who had come out of Wells Fargo 25 years. And she'd always kid me. At least I think she was kidding me. When she'd go, why would a banker listen to you? You've never worked a day in your life in a bank. And I go, yeah, it doesn't matter because here's what I here's my take. I know what it is that I know that they don't know. And I always stick to that as the story. <laughs> Uh, you want to talk asset <laughs> liability management, go to your, I'll be silent in the corner. You want to talk about consumer behavior and technology, that's what I'm going to speak up. So you can teach somebody the industry and they can learn it pretty quickly within a year, two years, maybe at the worst. You know, they'll see the, get a rotation True. through some of the things. You need to find somebody who's got this, you, I think, somewhat unique set of skills between business and technology. Um, in various forms, whether it's, you know, uh, marketing and market research, understanding consumer segmentation and behavior, or maybe it's in certain areas of court, uh, uh, you know, a, a fundamental technology type things. And they're not a programmer, but they, you know, or somebody who understands and can do uh, partnerships and things like that, or somebody who really understands how to innovate and build an innovation capability. Um, these are not the typical type of skills that a, a lot of people have in today's banks because they're focused on executing and operations. Um, it, so it, it's it's hard to find these people. Um, but yeah, I think you're right in that. Look, there are, are a lot of good examples, and I think the key for you know the next five to six years is for a lot of mid-sized financial institutions to grow those skills organically, not expect that they're going to poach and find it somewhere else. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, you're not just marketing the bank to consumers, you're marketing the bank to prospective employee employees. And, you know, you want to make your bank look attractive to future customers and existing customers. You have to make the bank look appealing to future employees. You Mm -hmm. got to start making, you know, Making bank make make banking cool again, um, <laughs> and then of course everybody who's listening goes, "Wait, when was it ever cool?" Hold yeah. on, Ron. I think you I think you missed something there, Ron. But, yeah. Okay, you know what I mean. Well, are, are there any banks that you can think of that are making banking cool right now? Uh, so, are we allowed to talk credit unions here too? Or oh, or financial about? institutions on the whole, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like, I think one of the first that comes to mind is Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. Um, they have been so aggressive, assertive uh, around technology use and doing cool things. Uh, April Clovis, the CEO there, Ben Maxim, uh, who now runs the Reseda Group, QSO. I mean, you know, they're they're just so out there with the use of technology and 
you know, they have the benefit of, of kind of serving a, a cool group, you know, I mean, yeah. they're focused on serving younger consumers. So they have to do this. Although I know that the management team is sitting there laughing, going, <laughs> you know, how many of our, our members are older, um, you know, professors and whatever. And, you know, who've, uh, you know, it's not all just about the young kids who come in, you know, and then leave after four years. Yeah. So I get it. But, you know, it, it's still about catching them at, at a younger age. So, that's really one of the kind of first that comes to mind. And I'm sure like as soon as we end this, I'll have like five banks that come to mind and go, oh, shit, I should have mentioned that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there's there's definitely, you know, a, a whole bunch that are, you know, doing cool things with technology um, driven by a good strategy and a good focus. And I, and I think that that builds a culture that, that – um, you know, attracts a certain type of person that they want. I mean, not everybody's going to want it. Some are going to want to go to Google, you know, put in their two years, make a ton of money, and then get fired when Google lays everybody off. Um, <laughs> or, you know, can deal with, you know, a super large organization like a Bank of America or J.P. Morgan Chase, which, look, is, is fact of the matter is it, it's right for a certain number of people, not everybody. That's the hard part. you got to find the people who don't want that, you know? Yeah. Uh, there's one bank that came to my mind. Do you know Steve Miller at uh, Fresno First yeah. Bank, FFB? Um, they uh, they don't take themselves too seriously. They do a lot of innovative things around payments and whatnot. They have fantastic marketing. I see online their commercials are, are hilarious. Um, that's one that I think uh, kind of sticks out in my mind as really putting it out there that they're cool, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and they walk the walk and talk the talk. I want your prognostication on a few things related to the executive ranks. So what do you think of this statement for a CEO? Could this happen in the next five years where a chief information or chief innovation officer is appointed as a CEO of a, of a financial institution? Um, there are plenty of examples of that already. Um... Uh, so yeah, that's that, that. That to me isn't isn't uh, even even remotely out there. Um, okay, there, there are plenty of examples of that already. Um, and in fact, in a lot of organizations, and you know this probably better than I do, Brian. You've got organizations that say, "I'm gonna," you know, they they pick out who they think the future CEO potential candidates are, and rotate them through a various you know set of of, of uh, roles like. Um, you know, chief marketing officer, chief information officer. So they might not even be techies these days. It's it's nice to have some technology skills in the CIO seat, but you know, it's it's a it's a senior management role. Managing the organization um, is probably the harder skill there, and that's why so many organizations added the chief technology officer. Um, same thing with marketing. It's just another position they get uh, rotated through. You know, look at uh, Jamie Dimon's strategies, always shuffling around the top management in the organization to give them broader set of skills, broader purview, more connections in the organization. And, uh, you know, not all of them are going to be CEO by any stretch of the imagination. But reality is, is that after they've done that for a while, if they're not going to get the top chair at, uh, at Chase, they're probably going to get a CEO role somewhere else. So yep. um, CIO, Chief Innovation Officer, it, um, I, there's already already great examples of that. Yeah, and I guess I I, I agree with you. Um, you usually you'll see like a COO or a CFO kind of making their way into that CEO seat. I tend to think that maybe a CTO and a CIO, since banking really needs to become tech, um, that's got to be a wave right, of, of the not future. It's about the role they're in; it's about the individual and their ability. You know, I I have said this a long time. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter what role they come from. What what matters is can they transcend the function they came from? Yeah. And um, yes, you know, it's it's often that they come either from the chief lending side, chief operations, or CFO role. But every one of them, if they're going to be a successful CEO, has to transcend the function they came from. Yes. And I think this is one of the bigger problems. You see CFOs that just you know can't get their heads out of the numbers. You get CLOs who can't seem to understand that there are actually other functions and lines of business in the organization that contribute to the success. And it isn't just all about golfing with, um, you know, prospects. 
Um, but it, it's, you know, the successful CEOs are those that transcend the function they come from. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly there. Last segment. What, what's your favorite movie? Oh my gosh. I have, I have a few favorite movies. Um, are there any bank movies that you're, that you like? And then of course, whatever other movies you want to throw in here. I'm just curious, favorite bank movie and just favorite movie. Now let's see the, when I think favorite movies, there's really three that comes to mind immediately. And I don't think there's a real banking connection. There's uh, but there are things that like, these are, these are literally the three greatest movies ever made. Uh, Monty Python on the Holy Grail. Animal House and Spinal Tap. Uh, everything wow. you need to know about life, you could learn from those those three <laughs> movies. They also uh, all came out kind of in the seventies and in eighties. There, when you know movies took chances and were you know interesting and fresh. I mean, those are three three great examples. So you don't watch dramas, I guess, at all. <laughs> um, so if I were to keep going down the list of movies. Um, you know the movie the Usual Suspects with Kevin Spacey? I yeah. can watch that over and over again as if I had never seen it before. Oh, yeah. Um, love great. that movie. I don't know what it is. Uh, maybe it's a secret desire to be Kaiser Soze or something. <laughs> um, may, that might be it. But, um, yeah, I'd add that one to the list as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I just, I've been asking that question and figured I would uh, throw it at you and see what came out. But I, those are fantastic So wait, so responses. yeah, I guess I do have one favorite movie that's kind of bank related, although not in a really good sense. Are you Robbery. Are with the movie uh, Inside Man with Clive Owen and Denzel Washington? Yeah, Spike Lee directed that. Yep. That's a, that's a uh, bank movie um, about a banker, you know, who wasn't particularly on the up and up there. So <laughs> maybe not a great example for the... You know, it's not a feel good bank movie. Let's put it that way. But, yep. you know, that's a that's another movie I can watch over and over again. I could pretty much watch any Denzel mo Washington movie over and over again, too, for that matter. That's a good one. I think Jodie Foster's in that as well. It's a great film. By the way, it's hard to think of good bank movies that don't have robberies in them. <laughs> I mean, it's like Dog Day Afternoon is one of my all time favorite movies. And they're thinking. the whole movie is a robbing of a bank. Yeah. Um but I was thinking about one movie. Do you remember Big with Tom Hanks? Yeah, yeah. There's one scene in a bank, and, you know, it's not it's just a scene where he goes to cash his check, and he's very particular about how he wants his money yeah. given back to him. That's a classic scene for me, and I think uh, that'll, that'll be added to my bank movie list. What about um, Trading Places with Eddie Murphy? I mean, that's kind of bank-related, no robbery there. but. Uh... Oh, definitely, and filmed right in Philly, right here, you know, several miles from where I am. Um, that'll be our next uh, podcast will all, will be uh, uh, more like Siskel and Ebert, maybe. Um, anyway, Ron, I I can't thank you enough for spending time with me and talking talent, um, talking about the industry. I hope we run into each other during all these conferences out there. Um, and uh, again, I, I wish you the best in your future endeavors. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. You bet. 